Hi there. In this lecture, we see one of Fisher's more wild and interesting games. So this was against Carlos Enrique Guimard. And Guimard is actually the player whose name is behind the Guimard variation of the French defence. It's a variation that I've enjoyed playing. It's like this of the knight d2, you play knight c6. So this is attributed to him, the name of this Guimard variation. This game is not a French defence. Uh, this is just a very, very exciting game. And in fact, um, this game was featured in one of Irving, Irving Chernov's books, The Golden Dozen, as one of the examples, one of the key examples of Bobby Fischer. So it's a very, very interesting game we're about to see. And it actually started with D4. So Guimard playing with the white pieces kicks off with D4. So why is this game so much fun? We see Fischer play Knight F6. Knight f3, g6, bishop g5, we see bishop g7, and now knight bd2, d6, e4. Has Fischer ended up by transposition in a sad kind of peer's defense? We see h6, and actually white volunteers the dark square bishop. And after bishop takes f6, plays a very curious looking bishop b5 check. It looks pointless because surely black's just going to play c6 and gain a tempo. Yes, but it does use up the c6 square. Guimond's not a bad player. In fact, he was awarded the IM title 10 years before this game in 1950 and the GM title in this very year of this game, 1960. Argentine champion in 1937, 38 and 41. He's not a bad player. This looks like a random move in many respects. Fisher plays c6. Uh, if knight c6, it's not the case that d5 has venom. This is actually rather okay for black. Black's actually got a small edge there with a lot of play. The point, one would assume, is actually e5 and queen e2 and then the option to double the pawns. I think that's the key thing, consideration with strong pressure on the e5 point undermining black's control of e5. This looks like a small edge. This must be the major point of bishop e5 check if uh, knight c6 for example is played. But c6 does use up the c6 square which means, in turn, there's going to be less pressure directly on white centre. So there's method in the madness of this move, it seems. Fischer castles, and now we see e5, bishop g7, queen e2. And Fischer reacts like any Piat's player would, trying to undermine white centre with c5. But, like any mad hacker attack player, Guimard actually goes for it. h4, he goes for Fischer's king. Fischer has to really defend carefully here. He does continue undermining the center at the expense of allowing, of course, h5. And this looks very dangerous. We have g5. And a very direct, direct indeed move, threatening checkmate in one. This is an interesting position where Fisher plays f5. It turns out that initially you might think rook e8 might hold up a little bit more. But the latest light engine technology does seem to give the impression black is actually busted here. For example, if white castles knight c6, knight c4, d takes, queen h7 check, knight f takes e5, this is just far too dangerous. The rook's kind of x-raying the king on the f file. And if, say, knight takes and bishop takes f4, so the bishop can't move because of queen h8 checkmate, this position, which seems safest, because if G takes, white's blast, blast through on the F file, these guys are specked out of pieces. And if here, bishop E4, bishop G6, this blast through, essentially, yeah. If queen takes, queen H7 and queen F7, it just seems to blast through. The whole lot seems to blast through. And if we look at bishop G7, again, this is blasting through for white. It seems all the lines just lose. Um... Because here, even though this might initially, engines might initially think this is equal, it's not. Queen g6 threatens all sorts of things. And um, if we get this position, rook e6 then, sorry, I mean rook e6 is threatens, it gets very complicated. But essentially, here, the pressure is too much to bear. This is very, very bad news, this position. If this is uh, happening, what eventually gets in h6 as an example. This is all very, you know, science fiction. But essentially, you know, this is checkmate. What does black actually do in this scenario? 
uh, it's it's kind of uh, it's it's kind of uh, very very uncomfortable. If Bishop d5, then White gets even more resources with Rook e5 taking g5 out, and after Bishop e4, it's all crashing through. You know, for anything, chatmate, this is just all winning for White. So this situation is actually technically lost. It seems on on current evidence, this situation here for Black Fisher is actually busted with best play from White. All of White's play seems actually justified here in retrospect. Fisher tries f5, and we have e takes on Bassant, rook takes, knight takes g5, a very violent move. And after d5, queen h7, check, king f8, here is where White makes a critical mistake, which seems to let Black back in the game. And it's only because Fisher is so resourceful and tact tactical that he's back in the game with the subsequent play. White castles, which looks entirely natural in many respects, but it's actually a mistake. It seems it's important to bid for the f file early in a way with f4. So sometimes this is useful for opening up the f file for White's favour, doing White a favour, uh, in fact. As an example of f4, if h takes g5, h6, and yeah, it doesn't matter about king f1, this position is too dangerous for black, because the f-file is being used with great effect coming up, it's slaughter time for the king. If we look at this again, instead of rook e6, if bishop takes check and taking the queen, that's no good. So it's actually, it's rather dangerous this position indeed. So this is the key mistake, and f4 seems to hold an advantage. If knight c6 here instead, uh, this situation is also, it's very interesting, more interesting for white than for black. If we look at knight c6 again, if knight b4 here, trying to take out the sting of white's attack by taking on d3 sometimes, and then bishop f5, the problem is, Bishop f5 should be played, but it allows queen takes f5, and then knight e6 check, and then white's better here. This is actually better for white, significantly. If black doesn't play bishop f5 here, and a6, then white plays rook e5, and ties black in knots. There's no bishop f5 now, and black's in a serious bind. And in fact, white, left to his own devices, will play like this, for example, and it's absolutely crushing. It's a really crushing position. So it seems White misses an opportunity by naturally castling. It looks very natural. Fisher plays knight c6. And yeah, it looks as though with these spectator pieces, Fisher is essentially having the cheek to say, look, I'm going to take out your light square bishop and I'm going to sort of try and do stuff on the light squares and the c file against your king. Fisher's that confident about his position, his resources. We see that in action now, f4, knight b4. So white's king safety is starting to be approached, believe it or not, from this position. After a3, knight takes d3, queen takes is played. If c takes, this doesn't help. There's queen c7 check hitting f4, and the attack evaporates into nothing. And here, in this situation, you might think, well, what about knight h3? Yeah, it's nothing, queen g4. So queen takes d3 is played, but now Fisher's getting stuff, tempos, which he can make use of. h takes h6. We have bishop takes h6 here. Yeah, uh, this is looking like Fisher's outrageously clearing away the, uh, the assets of white, rather than even just moving the bishop, not even giving... White, the opportunity is to keep the h pawn. Doesn't want to keep White's attack potential alive. Takes this off. F takes. And now, tempo gain. Huge tempo gain. Bishop f5. If bishop g7, then just taking the rook and a knight f3. White's much better here. So bishop f5, essential. We see rook takes h6. And now, yeah, this looks like a in very interesting move. It's a very interesting game. If queen e2 had been played, by the way, then rook c8, we can see the counterattack is well on the way here on the light squares. For example here, rook takes c2 check, rook takes d2 check, taking off the queen. This is actually much better for black. 
Instead of queen e2, if queen takes d4, queen c7 threatens checkmate. And here, bishop takes g5. And in fact, even if black loses a rook, this is a very bad position for white. Black can improve the attacking prospect like this. Now threatening checkmate on the light squares. It's all happening on the light squares. The bishop without the counterpart supporting a big attack. And this is now desperate for white. All of this stuff is desperate. It's desperately lost. So yeah, it's very, very interesting how Fisher's is getting a counterattack now. But rook takes h6 was played. Yeah. So now the queen is taken off. Check. And Fisher plays now king g7. So if g takes check, king takes h8. So Fisher's offering basically his queen and his rook potentially. After rook takes d8. Here at this critical moment, guess what Fisher plays in this position, which is super amazing. If I give you five seconds to pause the video. Black to play here, super amazing move. No wonder this is a game, this game is a favourite of Irving Chernev. So black to play here, it's been a real swings and roundabout roller coaster of a game. Okay. Rook c6, offering this a8 rook. That bishop without a counterpart is worth its weight in gold here. Amazing move. If rook takes d8 had been played instead, then just taking his check and then taking here knight up. Thanks very much. White's got a big advantage there, knight up. So, but rook c6, white takes the rook. Rook takes c2 check. We've got a bit of a seesaw here. Rook takes d2 check. Bit of a seesaw. The seesaw again, seesaw check. And then taking this other rook off with this part of the seesaw. So it's check winning this rook. So what a way to get into a rook and pawn ending. What a way indeed. Black's got central connected past pawns here against white's kind of flank pawns. Well, these two are doubled. And this is actually now very comfortable for black, this position. White offers that G pawn. But yeah, this is such a comfortable rook and pawn ending now. Fisher must have been mightily relieved. He got to play the Piet's defence and live to tell the tale. That's not the case in the engine world, by the way. When engines play each other in the Piet's, usually white wins uh, virtually every game. It's thought of as one of the more controversial openings. But here, Fisher lives to tell the tale in this end game, And we see his rook and pawn ending technique. He is very, very strong at rook and pawn endings. So king f6 here. And now taking off that. And now this cuts off the king. So he's got this one pass pawn. Uh, and yeah, it's, um, let's have a look. So the pawn is pushed. Getting behind the pawn. And now getting over here. And this looks like bad news. After king g2, white resigns. A titanic struggle there. Amazing resourcefulness in the fans. With best play, yeah, Fisher was busted. It is one of those Pierce defense transpositions that White managed to get against Fisher, which um, is actually the basis of some of the uh, knight c3 systems in the London system when you replace c3 with knight c3, trying to get the opponent when they play the king's engine into Pierce. So Fisher has been kind of tricked into a kind of inferior Pierce system. Uh, where White's got a really strong, you know, crude and effective attack. This is literally a lost position. Uh, but, uh, yeah, casting was inaccuracy in inaccuracy. Uh, so F4 was the key move. But, yeah, Fish is not playing computers. But he does act as though he is a computer himself sometimes. The amazing resourcefulness that Fisher has. Uh, he's like an early version of Stockfish, it seems. The resourcefulness of this game is absolutely incredible. Just because White Castle's queenside, the resources gained. Fisher takes out the light square bishop, weakens White on the light squares, and start, everything starts to backfire with culminating in a seesaw check. That seesaw check, just, you know, even though a rook down, he managed to get all his material back, going into a slightly better rook and pawn ending. It's an amazing game. Indeed, it has to be said. So one of the more fascinating games of Bobby Fischer. What a roller coaster. I hope you enjoyed it as much as me. As for instructive points, well, don't try and 
get don't get tricked into playing the Piat's defence because it can be lost with crude attacks coming your way. Maybe that's one instructive takeaway point. Unless you're Bobby Fisher and you're that resourceful, yeah, try and get counterplay by taking out uh, a light square bishop, and then you potentially get a seesaw ch check on the light squares. A great generation of light square counterplay after taking out white's light square bishop. Things seem to be on a total knife edge for black. Yeah, very, very careful calculation needed. Overall, this wasn't Fisher's tournament. Though, if we look at the context of this tournament, this was one of Fisher's yeah, worst tournaments of his professional career. Yet, this interesting roller coaster game exists in this tournament. Who would have thought that this game is is kind of within this one of Fisher's worst tournaments overall? This is in round fifteen. Okay, <laughs> thanks very much. Hi guys, if you enjoyed this video lecture. You might want to get more at my course, Kings Crusher TV slash Bobby Fisher, which I had a blast creating over 25 hours of video content. I tried to get the most instructive juice out of every single game covered and picking the most important games from this period. I had an absolute blast creating it, and I think you'll have an absolute blast checking it out. And it's at a big discount code with this link. You know, Kings Crusher TV slash Bobby Fisher has the discount code. So I hope you do check that out. Thanks very much.